Hello, my name is Dominica Radulescu. I'm a fiction writer and I teach French and Italian literatures and I chair the Women's and Gender Studies program at Washington and Lee University in the United States. Happy International Women's Day. I'm thrilled to join hands with women all over the world across this virtual bridge of female solidarity. I hope that one day, every day of the year, will be International Women's Day in the sense of complete gender equality, of a day when violence against women and discrimination based on gender, race, ethnicity, class, or sexual orientation will be a thing of the past. I will read a few excerpts from my two novels, Train to Trieste, Knopf, and Double Day, 2008, and Black Sea Twilight, Double Day, 2010. My novels tell stories of empowered female protagonists who embark on journeys of exile and self-discovery and who draw strength from the stories of their female ancestors and the love of their female friends and relatives. I will first read a passage from Train to Trieste in which my heroine Mona, a Romanian girl coming of age under the communist dictatorship of the 70s, discovers love and the story of survival and love of her great-grandmother. <clears throat> this summer I am 17. I am bursting into being a woman and I don't care about empty stores and sugar and flour rations. My blue eyes are blazing, my long limbs are taut and restless. I have wild, wheat-colored hair that flies in all directions and a great hunger in my flesh. All I care about is that this man who is grieving for his dead lover turn his eyes on me, notice my sun-bleached hair, my burning face, and play one of his melancholy guitar songs for me, for me alone. The smell of earth and death coursing through his heart makes me wild with desire. The summer when I am 17 and I fall in love with Mihai, I am drawn to great-grandmother's silver mirror. It has been sitting on the mahogany chest in my aunt Nina's living room for as long as I can remember. I stare at its chipped corner, its thick wooden back that once held a music box. In this enchanted summer, with a moon-studded sky and the taste of raw earth and fresh rain, I will my family stories into taking shape in the mysterious mirror. My great-grandmother saved herself from the big floods of 1918 by floating down, down the river Nistru on a big wooden door and holding to her chest a silver mirror with a music box that used to play Beethoven's Furelise. That was in the Moldavian city of Cetate Alba, the White Citadel, in the region of Bessarabia before it belonged to the Soviet Union. She's floating on the relentless river that is sweeping along wardrobes and vegetable gardens and chicken coops with her long blonde hair flying in the wind, holding to her breast a square silver mirror as she listens to the music over and over again, turning the key in the music box every time it stops. After many hours, the door she's floating on bumps against a tree. Somehow she manages to climb the tree while still holding the mirror and waits, barely conscious, in the nook of its thick branches for someone to find her. At sundown, with the water still rushing madly by her, the sky soaked in ominous violet reds, a man in a rescue boat approaches the tree and hears a faint tune like someone plucking a strange instrument. He finds my great-grandmother among the twisted branches, holding tight to the mirror and whispering notes like a lullaby. Vanya Golubov lowers her into his boat. He wraps her in blankets and makes a nest for her, then pulls hard for the distant bank. He tries to find out who she is, what happened to her family, what part of the town she's from. All he can get from her is her name, which he keeps repeating over and over again, Paraskiva Dumitrescu. She whispers her own name like a song, like a lullaby, just like she did the tune of the music box. He carries her into the house where he lives with his mother and lays her in the main room, asking his mother to help him undress her to get her some dry clothes. They live at the edge of the town where the waters don't reach, in a small white stone house. He falls in love with the lost yellow-haired girl as she goes in and out of her delirium talking about wild horses and soldiers floating on the river as he makes her drink little sips of water to bring her fever down. One night after three days of her rambling talk and fever he thinks she's going to slip away from him. 
Her pulse slows down and she burns so fiercely that the air around her is hot. His mother helps him wrap her in cool sheets at night and gives her cool teas made from Russian herbs. He talks to the girl continuously as if his words, which by dawn become as confused and meaningless as hers, could pull her out of her illness and away from death. And they do. One morning, with the first sunlight, when Vanya's mother finally goes to her own room to rest, Paraskiva suddenly stares at Vanya. It is the first time in a week that she's calm. She looks at Vanya as, she has known, as if she has known him all her life. She's neither terrified nor surprised to find herself in a man's house, in a man's bed, after having floated for days on rampant waters. She asks for the mirror. Did he find her mirror with a music box on the back? He shows it to her. It's safe. See? Just a bit dirty, he says, wiping it with his sleeve. It still works, he tells her, and he begins to wind the key. She stops him, gently touching his hand. He silences the stray notes. He places it in her hands. Keep it, he says, for good luck. It brought me to you. She starts laughing. Then he laughs too. They're shaking with laughter when Vanya's mother comes in. She watches them laugh and realizes that Paraskiva will live and that she will be her daughter-in-law. She is happy for her son, who has finally found his bride. It is 1918, and the war has swallowed up thousands of young men in its fields. The floods have swallowed up muddy villages and more lives. In the summer, they get married in the little garden with a village accordionist playing his two tunes for them over and over again, a happy one and a melancholy one. They drink the brandy made from fermented plums. They eat the cornmeal mush that peasants eat instead of bread and sometimes instead of everything else. That night, she wants to turn the key in the music box and listen to Fiorelise again in the same bed where Vanya pulled her away from the delirium and the edge of death with cool compresses and Russian herb teas. This is how the stories are kept in our family. A few big events, major catastrophes, and one or two scenes, some invented, some saved from sepia photographs. Others handed down and retold many times over the years to the point where they have become vague and misty, like fairy tales. I will now read a couple of um, excerpts from Black Sea Twilight, in which my heroine Nora, an aspiring artist and Romanian emigre in Paris in the 80s, discovers the Louvre and the French countryside with her refugee women friends. I go to the Louvre for the first time and join the groups of art students copying the various masterpieces as part of their training. I sit a little bit at a distance, yet close by, as if I was part of the group, but not really, and I do everything they do on my drawing pad. Copy the figures of women in Rubens' paintings, the Madonnas in the Italian Renaissance section, the busts in the Greek and Roman classical section. I take a break from my own style of unleashed fantastical forms and colors and follow the art students at the École Nationale des Beaux-Arts, pretending I am pursuing a course of study, pretending I am with them. The revered Venus de Milo at the top of the marble staircase gives me shivers of anger with her perfectly shaped, perfectly even breasts and thighs and that tilted head fabricated from a man's vision of female perfection. I delight in her missing arms. That's my favorite part of the Venus de Milo. I get dizzy at the sight of at, I get dizzy at the sight of the hundreds of larger-than-life naked female bodies bursting from every room in the Louvre like cascades of useless flesh. I am raw and have my hand sunk deep in a woman's personal tragedy, and I want to slap the Mona Lisa with her smug smile. What did these painters know of a woman's despair, passions, or self-loathing? And where are the women painters? I keep asking as I move frantically from one salon of canvases as big as boats to another salon of canvases by Romantic or Renaissance painters gone wild on female flesh. <clears throat> the Delacroix paintings infuriate me now that I see them life-size. Why did everybody send me to Paris 
Didn't they know that women don't get into the Louvre unless they are naked models or eager visitors? I run through the hallways of the Louvre searching for the Millets, the Courbets, the Barbizon School, the Van Goghs. I'm searching for the desperate painters, the artists of the wretched and the unfortunate, of golden flowers bursting out of misery and suicidal wishes. But they are nowhere to be found. I must be in the wrong museum. In the prints and drawing section of the Louvre, I run into Goya's sketch that portrays a scrawny human figure carrying a frightening burden on his head. It is the first work that speaks to me. It's about Nora and Anushka and Agadira, about them carrying burdens much heavier than they have strength for. I sob in front of the portrait of the Marquise de la Solana because she looks so much like my mother, dark, fierce, severe, staring at you without shame and dressed in black. My mother could have dressed like that and looked like that if she had been the pianist she had wanted to be and if her father hadn't been killed with an ax for a sentence he had uttered when the communists took over and if she hadn't torn from her breasts her green-eyed boy and given him away. Except maybe for the pink bow in the Marquise's hair. I don't think my mother would have ever worn a pink bow in her hair but she would have looked just as proud and majestic, a fierce matron of the Black Sea, playing Chopin's Etudes and, Italian's tar and Italian tarantellas on our grand piano on a wintry day, notes flying from under her fingers in waves like those of the tumultuous sea. It is only now that I start forgiving my mother for unleashing her cruel words throughout my childhood and adolescence, as I imagine she's starting really to love me now that I'm so far away. Now, when we are irreparably separated, my mother is painfully blooming in front of my eyes in the poetic incarnation of Goya's Marquise de la Solana in the black dress and the pink bow. As our trip continued, through little towns with Gothic churches and cafes in the center, or big towns with Baroque architecture and large avenues like Bordeaux, through hilly regions with stone houses hidden deep in the shade of pine trees, or by rocky seashores and beaches in the rhythm of our own steps or of the monotonous train wheels taking us across the French countryside, I found myself starting to reconnect to my Romanian past and to the landscapes of the 19 years I had spent in my country that was no longer my country. Because I had no country, I took possession of all countries. France was just the continuation of Romania with a stupid political division between them. The Atlantic was going to be my Black Sea. The Dordogne Valley with its broad river cutting through green forests was going to be my Dobroja Mountains with a broad Danube undulating between sandy shores and reeds. And the Mediterranean, whenever we got to it, was going to be my Black Sea too. It wasn't my fault, after all, that I hadn't been born in France, but under a silly dictatorship to which a bunch of fat old presidents at the end of Second World War consigned the Romanian people. No wonder the native French were afraid of refugees, for not only did we take away French people's jobs, as the saying went, but we greedily took away their mountains and oceans and lavender fields, their Gothic churches and classical theaters, and transformed them into as many countries as we had come from. I saw it in my friend Agadira's concentrated eyes too, as she was staring at the landscape rushing by the train windows, how the little French stone houses in the Dordogne were also the round huts along the Black Volta River in Burkina Faso, how the markets with fruit and vegetables were also the small shops by the side of the road in the capital, Ugadugu, that sold a modest mixture of products from grain to soap to cooking oil. We swallowed everything in our hungry stomachs and psyches, us refugees, and jumbled up frontiers and borders, mixed languages, were strident clothing and spilled our violent and messy stories all over neoclassical cities and shiny green countryside. <laughs>